So I think we can start and we continue our series of uh, department colloquia. And uh, today it's a pleasure to have with us and uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Rupert Frank, who was, uh, or maybe still is, a professor at Caltech and at MU in Munich. He's an expert, among other things, of variational models in mathematical physics, and he will talk about, uh, as you can see, from the liquid drop model for nuclei to the ionization conjecture for atoms. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for the invitation, and thanks to all of you for, for attending this talk. Um, I'm sorry for the hiccup we had at the beginning, and also now I can't see anything. So if anything is unclear, please interrupt me and speak up, because I mean, I can't see the chat or can't see your faces with the way this is set up. So no problem. Um, yeah, as I said, I mean, it's, it's great to do this. It's, of course, I would have preferred to do it in person. Actually, I... I love PISA very much. My, my brother did his PhD there and I was visiting there regularly. And one of these trips there was particularly memorable. And so if you feel bored during this talk and wanna talk about something else, here's a little riddle that I have. So I don't have the, the boarding pass from this trip back to PISA. I only have found in my, on my computer an old screenshot of the booking confirmation. This is in German. But what you see there is that on Sunday, oops, down there, on Sunday, uh, July 9th in 2006, I was flying from Munich to PISA. And the flight was arriving at uh, in the evening at 10.45 in Pisa. And so the question that I you can think about why is why when I arrived in Pisa, why did I walk, you know, with all my luggage and all my stuff, why did I walk by foot from the airport in Pisa to the city center on July 9th at 10.45 in the evening? Anyway, so that was an, a small aside. And let's get down to business. Let's talk about this liquid drop model that was mentioned in the in the title. And I've taken you a picture that many of you probably know from physics courses or something. And what's plotted here is the binding energy uh, per nucleon. Okay. So what we have on the x-axis, this is the number of nuclei. And what we have on the y-axis, this is the binding energy normalized per uh, nucleon. Okay, when I say nucleon, throughout the talk, I will not distinguish between neutrons and protons. So sort of, we were just counting them equally. And the fraction, which ones are neutrons, which ones are protons, is sort of thought as, as a given constant or something. Anyway, so we have the, the nucleons down here on the, on the x-axis and the binding energy per nucleon on the y-axis. And you see that curve goes up first until it reaches a certain maximum that's here, that's iron, Fe56, and then it goes down again. And so there are certain... Um, I mean, remarkable features, or what does this mean? So what, first, what we have here on the left part, up to iron, right, where the curve is monotone increasing, there you see that the binding energy per particle increases as you increase the number of nucleons. So that's what's going on now in our sun or in stars, where you gain energy by um, going to heavier nuclei, right? That's the, the principle of nuclear fusion. Okay, when you go from, from hydrogen to helium, then there's a, a difference, and that difference is sort of what you gain in energy. On the other side, hand, when you go out, I mean, to the right of iron, then you see it's the other way around. So what you do there in, in order to, to get energy that's done in, in I mean, for instance, in, in nuclear fission, is that you try to break up a big nucleus, you break it up into smaller pieces. And again, because you go now on the x-axis, you go to the left towards zero, you actually have a gap in the energy and that's what you gain, okay? So this very 
qualitative picture somehow explains this difference between nuclear fission and nuclear fusion. Another feature that's explained here, I mean, even if it's not obvious, is sort of the picture stops somewhere. Right? And that's actually also something that we see in nature. There, are, there is something like a maximum number of nucleons that can exist. There are just no nuclei which are, have many, many nucleons. Okay, so the graph suddenly stops. All right, and so this picture was known for, for a long time and measured and so on. And then in 1928, Gamow tried to find some sort of model to explain these things that I just mentioned. Okay, so to deduce them from something, I mean, it's not really mathematical, but some, some sort of model. And so the way he thinks about this, or perhaps mathematicians now think about what he said is, for a nucleus, we allow any uh, measurable set in R3, okay? And so we think of this set being composed out of uh, nucleons, and those nucleons are in this set with a constant density. They're uniformly distributed in that set. And therefore, the measure of the set, that's the number of nucleons, okay? Now, next thing that Gamow says is there is something like nuclear matter. This would mean that everything, the whole space, is completely filled with nucleons. Okay, and so what Gamow postulates there is that if you fill the whole space with um, nucleons, you will have a constant density. And now, if you want to look at now a finite nucleus, like these that we talked about, iron or, or whatever, um, then you have to cut out from this infinite big nuclear matter, you have to cut out a particular nucleus. Okay, and so we're interested in the energy of that particular nucleus that we cut out. And so how does that um, work? So the energy, Gamow postulates, consists of two pieces. The first part, that's a perimeter. That's sort of because compared to this infinite nuclear matter, you've sort of lost the, the interaction between, you know, the, the nuclei which are exactly on, sitting on the boundary of this nucleus you're interested in and the, the things that you cut away. And he says that, well, this energy is proportional to the perimeter. And then he says, well, in order to compute or talk about the existence of nuclear matter, well, what we talked about were strong forces somewhere in the nucleus, but what we did not talk about are, is the Coulomb repulsion between the, um, between the protons. And so therefore he says, well, the Coulomb repulsion between the protons is just the double integral dx dy over 1 over x minus y, right? And now integrate it over all pairs x and y that, that you can have. Okay? These are all the, the protons um, repelling each other. And sort of here he uses this implicit assumption that the, the number of protons relative to the number of nucleons is sort of a fixed constant. Anyway, so if you believe that, then you arrive at the energy functional, where you have the surface area and the Coulomb repulsion. And now you ask yourself, well, those nuclei that we should see, those should be the stable ones. Or ideally, they should be the minimizers. So now look at all possible sets of a given measure and ask yourself, how small can you make this energy for this given number A? And that thing that you call or think of as the nucleus of with A nucleons. And then, just to, to connect it with the picture that we've seen above, is you can, the, the quantity of more physical interest is actually the, the energy per particle. So it's EA over A, and that's exactly what's plotted up there. It's just that physicists like to switch the sign. So what's plotted here is just minus EA divided by A. Okay? So... This was all very, uh, you know, hand-waving. There were lots of assumptions, physical assumptions, and we're rather far from, from any mathematical theory. 
Um, nevertheless, I mean, the fact is that Gamow says, and lots of numerics done by physicists say that this model correctly describes uh, this curve that we see there. So it um, describes the binding energy per nucleon, the, the general shape of this curve. It describes the phenomenon of fission. It describes the non-existence of very large nuclei. So can we make mathematical sense out of this? And now, before I talk some more about this, let me show you some, some pictures of related prediction in the physics literature that we're even further away from understanding. And so what I was talking so far was, you know, I said, let's look at a single nucleus, somehow that sits there in complete vacuum, there's nothing around it. Now, really, what you should be um, looking at, or I mean, not depending on which model you, you want to study, but when you are interested in neutron stars, for instance, then you're in a regime where you have very many nuclei. And you don't look at them individually in vacuum, but rather you study them in sort of a neutralizing background. Okay, so what's here down there in this sector, that's the, I mean, uh, the cross uh, section of a, a neutron star. And you see in particular there the, the outer crust, and then you go in, further inside towards the core. And as you do that, as you go from the outside to the inside, you see that the, the structure of matter changes. So here at the beginning, you see these, roughly speaking, these individual nu uh, nuclei. They sit very, very far from each other, just one here, there's another one down there, there's another one here, and they almost don't feel each other. Now, as you go further in towards the core, the, the density of this uh, neutron star increases and the relative fraction of uh, these nuclei increases. So as you somehow increase this density, you see they become a denser and denser and they start feeling each other. And then at some point, there is a transition, a very rapid transition, where you go from, um, roughly speaking, a three-dimensional periodic structure to a structure which has a two-dimensional per uh, periodicity. And there's a very um, nice name for this. These are called the nuclear pasta phases. Okay, so there's the gnocchi phase. That's where you have these individual guys sitting there. As you go, when you have the transition, you arrive at the spaghetti phase, right, where you have these long lines, the nuclei form these lines, the lines are supposed to arrange themselves according to a two-dimensional periodic lattice, and then just go trivially in the third direction. Now, when you increase further, we arrive at the lasagna phase. At less, the lasagna phase, you see now the nuclei become something like thin plates. They're stacked on top of each other and sort of arranged according to a one-dimensional lattice, right? With a just um, equally spaced on top of each other. And then you further increase the, the fraction and then the whole picture flips. Okay, so then some at some point, you 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 have the, the opposite thing. You have these what the anti spaghetti. This is somehow the spaghetti are now missing, and the anti gnocchi where everything is filled except for these little things. All right. So these are pictures that are taken from from physics papers. They are, I mean, this is not measured. This is just um, you know postulated that this should exist, but it's very well studied, and there are numerical computations. And again, we arrive at the mathematical problem: Does any of this make sense? Can we derive any of this from uh, this simple uh, liquid drop model? So that was sort of an introduction, which was very hand wavy and now I want to go step by step more towards more mathematical things, okay?
So it's somewhat surprising because, as I told you, I mean, Gamow did this stuff in the 1920s. And physicists have studied this since, I mean, very detailed. I mean, both in the early days, in the in the 40s and 50s, when when people were trying to build a bomb, and but also then the, these nuclear pasta things, they were studied heav heavily, starting from the 70s and 80s. But mathematicians only picked up on this about 10 years ago, and there is some sort of uh, summary where you can read more about this, more about the, the background and the goals in an article in the notices of the AMS by Choksi, Muratov, and Topalolo. Okay, that was from uh, 2017. And in particular, since this has only been studied for such a rather short time, there are really quite a number of fundamental questions that are open. And so a first question that I would like to mention is can one make any sense of the derivation of this model? You know, can you write down some microscopic model where you really talk about individually about the, the different nucle uh, nucleons and then arrive later at this uh, sort of, well, at this liquid drop model, right? Where, which is more like a statistical model where you have this constant density assumption and all that. Okay, this is connects with things that are very much studied in mathematical physics, where you try to do scaling limits, where you have um, models that describe a phenomenon in very much detail. And then you try to get to a different um, model where you um, ignore information, but which becomes much uh, easier to solve. Now, a different question is what I said so far was kind of very static, right? I was talking about a nucleus and it does that, does that. But really, when you think about what I said before about the motivation, about this phenomenon in particular of nuclear fission, you know, where the, where the nucleus breaks apart into uh, two pieces, that's very much a dynamical process. And as far as I'm aware, there is no mathematical work on, on, on really studying this process. And I think that would be very interesting. I also think that it's not so easy. It, there are some relations to the mean curvature flow, right? Because somehow when you just look at the variation of the, the perimeter, that's the mean curvature. So in sort of, so which, which is the, the important thing for the mean curvature flow. And so a lot of mathematical properties should be similar to the mean curvature flow. However, we must not forget that it's actually the non-local term, this Coulomb repulsion between the nucleons, which is responsible for the phenomenon of fission. So that cannot really be ignored either. And then a, a big difference between the, the mean curvature flow and the flow that's uh, probably relevant here is that the mean curvature flow is um, a parabolic equation, right? Whereas here, one would rather look at a Hamilton, uh, Hamiltonian model. Anyway, so that's the second thing. And the third thing that connects to these nuclear pasta phases that I was talking before. So in, in mathematical physics, the emergence of periodicity, which is so ubiquitous in, in nature, has essentially not been proved in two entire dimensions. And so any result of that kind would be really a, a breakthrough showing that, I mean, and in particular, I mean, what one wants to show here is even more, I mean, that you have different types of periodicity. I mean, first a three-dimensional periodicity, then a two-dimensional periodicity, then a one-dimensional periodicity, and then all the way back. And so I think that's a, it's a great problem. As far as I know, this was suggested in a, in a paper by Knupfer, Muratov, and Novaga. And I refer you to a very a nice and good uh, introduction on that topic and also to some results in that direction. Now, my talk today will not address any of these three things, right? I will talk about um, ground state properties, which is where we can say something more. But I really wanted to mention this and, and um, I mean, emphasize that I think that this is all very interesting.
All right. So once again, let's go back to the Gamov problem. You have the, the surface area. You know, I'm writing perimeter of omega for those of you who know what the perimeter is. Um, for everybody else, this is just the, the surface area. And then we have the, the non-local term, which represents the repulsion between the, the nucleons. And what you see here in this, and you try to remember, we try to minimize this over all measurable sets omega with a given measure. What's interesting about this model is that you have a competition between the two terms. Now, the first term, the perimeter, that's obviously a, a short range term, right? So if you have two pieces uh, which are disjoint, then the, the perimeter doesn't care. It's just the perimeter here and the perimeter there. And that's it. The other thing, um, the non-local term, the Coulomb repulsion, that's a very long range force. Because even if you put the sets apart, they still feel each other. And actually, the two terms, they want different things. So if you think about the isoparametric inequality, remember that inequality says that if we minimize the perimeter on the all set of a given volume, then we want to be a ball. Okay. So therefore, the, this first term, when you ignore the second term, then you want to be a ball. You want to be round. Whereas the other term, the Coulomb repulsion, actually wants the opposite. The Coulomb repulsion, among all sets of equal volume, is largest when you're a ball. That's called the Reese rearrangement inequality. Okay, so that guy wants to be a ball. That guy wants to be as far away from the ball as possible. It really wants to spread out everything. And now there is a magic number, A star, which has a completely analytic, explicit expression. And numerically, this is about 3.5. And what's so special about this number? Well, see, you can um, plug in, you can evaluate the, the energy at the ball, right? I mean, for given number A, there's a unique radius such that um, this is the, the volume of that ball, and then you plug this in and you get a curve. Okay, so that's the energy of a ball. When the nuclear arrange, uh, want to arrange themselves in the shape of a ball. Now, there's something else you can do. You can take this total number of nucleons that you have, this number A, and you can split it into two pieces, A over 2 here and A over 2 there. And now what you say is that these A over 2 nucleons on that side, they become a ball. And these A over 2 nucleons on that side become a ball. And so you take this configuration of two disjoint balls of the same volume and plug that into the energy function. As I said before, the surface area doesn't care how far these balls are apart, but the Coulomb repulsion wants to push the two balls as far as possible away from each other. And that gives you, when they're infinitely far apart, gives you another number. Okay? So we got two different energies now. For each fixed A, we got two different energies. One is the energy of, of a single ball, and one is the energy of a ball broken up into two uh, equal sized balls. And the magic number A star is precisely the number such that below A star, you do better by keeping stuff together, by taking a single ball, and above A star, you're doing better by splitting the stuff up into the two pieces. Okay, that's a computation you use. I mean, compute these integrals and, and then you set them equal and that's how you arrive at this number A star. All right, and now here's a conjecture. Now, that conjecture, I guess, is, is, in physics is not a, a conjecture. It's a fact. I mean, you open your favorite nuclear physics textbook and you see a sentence in there like obvious nuclei are round or something. 
Anyway, for us mathematicians, this is a conjecture. And as far as I understand, uh, this conjecture appeared first in work by Choksi and Pelletier. And it's supported by, actually they were interested in a different physical model, but which has the same mathematical formulation. And there's extensive numerical evidence for this conjecture. Anyway, here's what the conjecture says. I like to call this the non-compromise conjecture. Now, it says that for A less than the magic number, every minimizer of this functional is a ball. Okay, so that's the, the first scenario that we discussed. If A, however, becomes larger than the magic number, there is no minimizer for E of A. Okay, so this means all the stuff somewhat disappears. Now, why do I say no compromise? Well, the point is, see, what you could think is that the, the two forces start to negotiate with each other. Well, the perimeter wants to be a ball, but yeah, okay, if it's not a ball, it's still fine, it's not too bad. And so the, 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 the Reese arrangement inequality, or the, I mean, the, the Coulomb term, they said, well, they don't want to really be a ball, but okay, so they go a little bit away from a ball. And then they meet at some in-between thing, like an ellipsoid or something, even, I mean, some dumbbell shape or something like that. But that could a priori happen. I don't see any, any reason, any physical reason really why you can, why they can't, cannot agree on a compromise, the two forces. But actually the conjecture says, no, there is no compromise. Either the perimeter wins, and when the perimeter wins, then the perimeter has it its way, a ball, as, it, as the perimeter wants. Or the Coulomb term wins, and then the Coulomb term has it its way, meaning there is no minimize, everything is spread out. All right, that's the conjecture. And I should say right away, this conjecture is open. We don't, we don't know how to prove this. I think it would be very nice if, if we could um, prove this, if we could understand this better. So let me tell you the things that are known. The first result is that when A is small, smaller than a certain number A1, then the minimizers are balls. Okay, that was shown by Knupfer Muratov and by Julian. Now, this is actually mathematically a, a very interesting problem. And as many of you know, there was in the last decade, big progress among the, the quantitative versions of the isoparametric inequality that was started by Fusco Maggi Bratelli. And this has really inspired lots of analysis done in the last 10 years. What they say is that when the, ener the, the isoparametric energy, right, I mean, the, the quotient, the normalized quotient between the perimeter and the volume is close to that of a ball, then actually the set have to be close to, the set has to be close to a ball, okay? And moreover, an important aspect of this result is that you quadrat, that the minimum is a quadratic minimum, so quadratically close. And so what Knupfer Muratov and Shulin and other people who worked on this problem later used were these version of the, the quantitative isoparametric inequality. And I should say that as far as I know, there is no explicit value for this A1 now. See, when I go to my physicist friends and ask them, well, we could show that at least small nuclei are round. That's what I would like to show them. And then they ask me, well, how small is a small nucleus? Well, then I can't tell them anything. Okay, so the Fusky Machi Pratelli paper, that was using compactness. That like you did not give any number in the, in, the, um, in the inequality. The other paper, um, later there was a paper by Figali Machi Pratelli that is a quantitative that gives uh, an explicit number, but then you have to, if you look at the proofs here, you have to go through the regularity theory of sets of finite perimeter. And I mean, even in case you should be able to make all of this quantitative and lose um, and get rid of any compactness everywhere, I think the numbers that you have there are very, very far from this number 3.5 that we're aiming at. 
Okay. Um, also, the, uh, a later proof by uh, Chikalis and Leonardo is by compactness. Anyway, so that was the small theory. I'm, I'm mentioning this because there's an open problem, right? We want to we wanna find, even if we cannot prove the conjecture, we want to find a good enough value for A1, which somehow is close to 3.5. Now, let's go to the other end of the conjecture, right? The conjecture says that if A is greater than 3.5, then there should be no minimizer at all. Um, there is such a, um, a proof, at least when A is very large, larger than a certain number A2, and that was shown by Knupfer and Muratov and independently by Lu and Otto, and that uses, again, ideas of geometric measure theory, and while this value of A2 is more tractable than the values of A1, it's rather large what they got. And then let me mention a third result, which is something that I was involved in recently with a colleague at Munich, Fanta Nam, and that is we could show that for this problem, there is a minimizer up to A star. Okay, so at least we're talking about something. I mean, we know that there is a set which either can be a ball or cannot be a ball, but at least there is a minimizer. Okay, that's already something. And what's somehow interesting about our proof is that, again, this number A star appears very naturally. And not only do we prove the, the existence of a minimizer less than A star, but actually we, we prove more, which sheds further light towards this conjecture. I would love to, to tell you more about this, but I decided to focus on something else for this talk, namely about this non-existence result. Okay, so remember the non-existence result is that if you have more than 3.5 nuclei, then if A is greater than 3.5, then this energy functional constraint to have sets of measure A does not have a minimizer. And a while back, five years ago, again with NAM and now also with Ron Killip, we were able to give a quantitative version of this and say that um, you don't have a minimizer when A is greater than eight. Okay, so at least, I mean, I understand that eight is greater than 3.5, but at least it's a number, uh, uh, a number that you, I mean, that is explicit, that it's not way too big. And moreover, what's interesting about eight is that eight is smaller than 10, and why is 10 interesting? Well, if you look at this functional, right? I mean, one thing you might mm, think about is doing a local stability analysis. You look at the ball and you perturb it slightly just by wiggling the boundary or something, right? That gives you a local stability criterion. And something that was known in the physics literature since the, the 40s is that exactly at A equal to 10, the ball starts losing stability against local perturbations, okay? Put differently, up to 10, you're locally stable, okay? And then you're instable. So what's interesting about this is sort of that, see, you're no longer a globe, the ball is believed to no longer be a global minimizer after 3.5, but is still believed to be a local minimizer up to 10. And now if you want to put this in a poetic language, you can say that these are exactly the radioactive elements between 3.5 and 10, right? These are elements that kind of are locally stable, but which are not global minimizers. So if you include different effects that, that are not in the model, they would kind of go down from the local minimum eventually to the global minimum. Okay, but locally they are, they are at least stable. Anyway, so, so that's the result. And since I wanted to include one proof in this talk, I, I will give you this proof. And don't, don't be afraid, it's a very simple proof. I give this proof whenever I give a talk to finishing high school students, when I give uh, talks to uh, starting uh, undergraduate students. It's, it's a simple proof. But so far, I have nobody has been able to improve the eight. It's a challenge, 
I mean, look at the proof. It will be one, one slide here. And I would be more than happy if I see an email tomorrow by one of you who can get the eight down by something. Now, here's the proof. All right, so let's take, let's assume that omega is a minimizer for this problem for some A. And what we want to show is that, therefore, the measure or the volume of uh, omega is less than 8. All right? Now, what do I want to do? Is I want to fix a hyperplane. Now, that hyperplane is described by a normal direction nu and by L, which is the distance of the hyperplane to the origin. And now I just slice my set omega by this hyperplane and I call omega plus the part on one side of the hyperplane and omega minus the part on the other side of the hyperplane. Okay, so I slice my set into two pieces. Now what I do is one half of the set I keep as it is and the other half I move away. And now of course, I mean, the, the total measure Right. It's still the same. I mean, the one part is sitting there. The other part, I haven't taken away mass. I've just moved it. So this is still uh, an admissible candidate for my variational problem. And therefore, the energy of this guy is greater or equal than the energy of the minimizer by minimality of the energy. So now, as we talked about before, um, the, once the sets are apart from each other, the perimeter doesn't care anymore. And Coulomb is happy when it's the second set is shifted all the way out to infinity. So really, in this inequality that I have, I can just take L equal to infinity. And then the left side becomes just the energy of the left plus the energy of the right. Okay? So, but the right... Now, let's look at this. So, right, so we have the inequality that the sum of the energy on the left plus the energy on the right is greater than the original energy. Now, let's look at the, these things. So, let's look at the perimeter term, right? So, what happened with the perimeter? Well, the, just think of the set, right? By slicing, you introduced additional perimeter. Now, how much perimeter did you introduce? Well, that's exactly the, the area of this section when you cut the set by the hyperplane. Okay, so that's this. Okay, and so I'm taking the, the area of this set. And this comes twice because I, it, I have it once on the left and once on the right. So that's the perimeter that I've introduced. Now let's talk about Coulomb. For Coulomb, I have reduced things. Right? Because for the Coulomb, before, so there's always the left talking to the left, the right talking to the right, and that's all there is when I look at the Coulomb the contribution to that. However, when I look at that, at the original energy, well, there's left with left, right with right, but then there's also where the left talks to the right. right? That's this term here that comes twice, but since I, in my definition, there's a one half in front, there's a constant one here. And now, so by energy minimality, I got this inequality. Good. Now, this is an inequality that holds for every hyperplane. Put differently, it holds for any of my two parameters, nu and L. So what I want to do is I want to just integrate this identity that I got with respect to my uh, parameter L, right? That's the position of the hyperplane with the fixed normal. Now on the left side, right, that's just Fubini's theorem. You slice a set by hyperplanes. Now you shift the hyperplane, you integrate with respect to that parameter. What you just get on this side here, integrated with respect to L, is twice the volume. Fine. Now we want to integrate the right side here. It's double integral. And now the way we do this is we just rewrite this. I mean, we want to rewrite it as an integral over omega times omega. And just, I mean, saying that x belongs to the left and y to the right means just that we have the, cons the characteristic function where nu dot x is smaller than L and nu dot y is greater than L. And then we can integrate this with respect to L, right? And what we get is simply this quantity. Right, that's just a, that's an elementary integration in L. Good, so that's the inequality that we got now after integration in L. Now, well, we still have one more parameter, nu, 
So what can we do? We can average with respect to new, because we don't know which new to choose. If we would have a good choice, uh, that would be better. But all I can think of is averaging. So the left side doesn't depend on new. So when I average, it stays two, ohm, two times the volume of omega. Now on the right side, well, I have to do a little integral. That's an integral over the sphere, right? And so I, I, this is the average. And so I see that this is, I mean, the important thing when you just think about uh, what comes out is just, I mean, this is if you have a vector and you dot nu dot the vector and you integrate that with respect to nu, this is just proportional to the length of A, right? This is radially symmetric. So whatever comes out here after averaging is absolute value of, I mean, length of Y minus X. And that cancels exactly the denominator. So the, the two guys, this disappears, right? And what you're left with is just the in, double integral over omega times omega, which is the volume of omega squared. Now, the computation that I alluded to before was that you get exactly a factor one quarter. That's a computation that you can do. Okay, so let's read this. Two times the volume of omega is equal to one quarter times the volume of omega squared, which means that the volume of omega is less than eight. That's what we wanted to prove. Okay, one page proof. I, as I said, I would love to, to improve that. I mean, I guess one can show that it's never equal to eight by, by look, doing this a little bit more carefully, but to get really any significant improvement, that would be very nice. Okay. So that somehow concludes what I wanted to say about the liquid drop model. Now I'm going to something else. What I'm going to talk about now is the so-called ionization problem. And so the physics now changes very drastically. Now we're talking about atoms. Okay, so the, the electrons that are surrounding the nucleons and the, or the nucleus, and actually the nucleus now is just a point. We don't care about the, the structure, the shape of the nucleus. It's, for us, it's just a point. And the question the physics question that's behind this is how many electrons can a nucleus of charge Z bind? Okay, so you have a nucleus which has charge Z, and now you put throw electrons in, right? And then the, the electrons stick to the nucleus. And then at some point when you have too many electrons, they don't stick anymore, right? Because they're no longer attracted. Because they are the other electrons are already there. So the question is, how many electrons can you make stick at this nucleus of charge C? And there's a, a conjecture, a famous, um, I mean, it's again, it's something that is written in any physics textbook as a given fact, or you can also look at your favorite, uh, you know, database about um, atoms. And so the conjecture is that no more than Z plus one electrons can stick to a nucleus of charge Z. Okay. Sometimes, you know, sometimes it's believed that it's, it can also be Z plus two. So it's not completely clear. I mean, since we don't know how to prove it anyway, it's, there's no point of making a very precise conjecture, but it should not be too many. Not too many extra electrons can stick. Okay, now um, when you want to turn this into a mathematical problem, it's actually has certain similarities, both on the, on the level of formulation of the problem and on the level of uh, solution to this liquid drop problem that we discussed. So why is that? Well, again, we want to talk about, we're talking about ground states of atoms. So it's certainly a minimizer of a certain variational problem. And again, what does it mean that these electrons don't bind, that they don't stick? Well, that just means that there is no minimizer. Okay, it means that the um, minimizing sequence is not um, compact, right? Because stuff goes away. The extra electrons go away. Just like before the nucleons um, above a star, the, the nucleons are supposed to go away. All right. Now, the 
underlying, so this is typically phrased for a quadratic minimization problem, where the underlying operator is the Coulomb many body shooting operator, which is this operator. If you haven't um, seen that before, uh, don't worry, this will be not be the, the main point of my talk, because unfortunately, we don't have anything new to report on this problem. Let me just mention one thing. It's important that you look at this operator on anti-symmetric functions, which physicists call fermions. So it's not, it has something to, be, to do with statistics of the particles. If you look at this operator for arbitrary particles, it's not true. And then I should say that, I mean, in the, in the 80s and in the 90s, there were the, the results on this problem. And so the best known bound so far is due to Pfefferman and Seiko, who showed that at least for large Z, this number of electro extra electrons that can stick increases at most like Z to a power 5 over 7. Okay. And then there's a, a result by Leap, which, I mean, has a factor two in front, but at least it's not an asymptotic result. So for small z, this is better. And then NAM in uh, 2012 improved Leap's result for moderate um, atoms. Anyway, as I said, this is not really what I want to talk about. Um, what I do want to talk about are simpler theories of atoms. Because this just this this many body, if I, I perhaps I should show this, this is a variational problem in R to the n variable. Um, sorry, R n in R to the three n, so in the three n variables. So sort of as you you want to prove this, your, um, your n, your space, I mean, your, your, fun your function space where you're looking at increases. And I mean, that's sort of, that's one of these microscopic models that I mentioned at the very beginning. And rather, both for mathematical analysis and also in, in applications for computations, one often likes to have these macroscopic models where you've reduced the number uh, of degrees of freedom. Okay, and so one of these simpler models is Hartree-Fock theory, and in that, that's the most complex theory, approximate theory, that is usually used. Solovey was able to prove this bound, at least in the form that this extra number of electrons that can stick is bounded by universal constant uniformly in Z. And Soloway has not only proved this, but he has actually produced a strategy of proving this, a certain multi-scale analysis strategy, which is based on comparison to another approximate model, which is the so-called Thomas Fermi theory. And you have to, there are some PDE ingredients, the Sommerfeld asymptotics, is a PDE theorem about uh, the Thomas Fermi equation and perturbations thereof. There are some convergence aspects. And then the most important thing that I want to focus on today concerns a priori bounds. Okay, so what do I mean by this? Um, you see, I mean, these are again lots of words, but I'm trying to get to something mathematical that we can uh, discuss again. And so the a priori bounds is that you want to bound the number of electrons by the, the charge that's there. And there was a strategy of doing this due to Ben-Gurion and Leap, but that does not work in some models. And what I want to tell you is that what we've learned in the previous model, in the liquid drop model, actually helped us solve one of these old conjectures in this business this is a conjecture by Leap from 1981, where we can prove that you do not have a minimizer provided you are greater than, I mean, provided the number of electrons is greater than Z plus a constant C, independent of Z. 
once again, the theorem says that in a certain model, which I will turn to in a second, in a certain model, there is no, the, the number of electrons is bounded by a constant uniformly in the value of the nuclear charge. Okay, meaning a certain variational problem has no minimizer when we're large. Again, look at the, the analogy to the liquid drop problem, right? You want, you have a certain parameter. When this parameter is large, you want to prove non-existence. Okay, so let's look. So these were lots of words. Now let's get back to, to mathematics. And this is actually the, the last slide, so um, not much more is going to come. Let's look at this. So we have an energy functional. The energy functional concern contains a good friend of ours, the Coulomb repulsion. Except that now it's a little different. Before it was the Coulomb repulsion be between two characteristic functions sets. Now, instead, we have densities. We have a function rho, which is a non-negative function. Right? Before, we had the constraint that the volume of the set was equal to A. Well, now the integral of rho is constrained to be fixed to N. Okay? So this term is a friend of ours. So the repulsion, before it was the repulsion between the, the protons, now it's a repulsion between the electrons. Okay, good. Now, there's some other stuff here. And what I want you to focus on is, well, one term is this one, the z divided by x. That's now the attraction to the nucleus. The electrons are attracted to the nucleus, right? So that thing wants, I mean, if we want to make this term as small as possible because of the minus sign, we want to have rho somehow concentrated at the origin. Right? So in order that the 1 over x becomes large with a minus sign, it becomes very negative. Now, of course, we want to, I mean, the, the row still needs to be spread out. We don't want to create a delta function or something. And that's sort of what these extra terms do. The row to the 5 thirds and this term, which involves a gradient, you should think of these terms as something like the perimeter. Okay, This is a short range force which keeps stuff together. And what makes this problem hard is that there's an additional term with a minus sign, minus rho to the four thirds. Okay, and this has some clear physical origin. It's called the exchange term or the exchange correction to the, the repulsion term here. Let me not go into this, but the mathematically the problem is that this term makes the functional not convex. Okay, With, without this term, the function would be convex in a row and things would be much, much simpler. But we do have this term and we have to deal with that. And actually, so up to our work, which was again done in collaboration with NAM and also with Hannefan and Bosch, it was not even known that there is a maximum number of electrons that, that can be bound I mean, possibly depending on Z, right? So, I mean, it was not known whether for large N, this minimization problem here does not have a minimizer. And the reason was exactly that because of this non-convexity, the, uh, all the previous methods did not work. And in order to prove this, we follow most of Solovey's strategy. This is a long paper, you know, this is 50 pages long or so. And I cannot explain all of this. But the important thing that I want to stress is the a priori bound that we get. And I want to stress that because um, the method, you know, the method that we talked about back then, which gave us the eight volume uh, less or equal than eight, that seemed like a very ad hoc method which works in this problem, but that's it. I want to convince you of the opposite. I want to convince you that this is actually a very flexible method, that you can adapt this and use it in other problems as well. And that with this method, you can actually beat strategies that have been around before. 
Okay, and so the a priori bound that we want to prove, or that one wants to prove in this problem, is that the number of electrons that are outside a certain radius, right, so that's x greater than r, the number of ro electrons outside the ball of radius r is controlled by the charge, but it's actually a screened charge. What does that mean? See, you have a charge z originally there, but then there are all the other electrons floating around. So they actually reduce the effective charge that the outside electrons feel. So therefore, from z, you should subtract the charge created by the other electrons inside the ball. Right? So the outside electrons feel only the charge that's left over after you've subtracted the charge from the electrons up to R. And now this bound, so the trivial version of this bound is with R equal to zero. You just want to control the maximum number, the, the total number of electrons by the charge. Right? Then you can forget this screening term. That you do in more or less the same way as what we did, just use your, your hyperplanes. Do the averaging. For integrate with respect to L, integrate with respect to nu. It's a really simple exercise. What I want to tell you is that you can do this, namely now you don't take just a hyperplane, but you take a more geometric set that fits the geometry of what you want to do. In this case, in particular, it's essentially a hyperplane with a ball taken away. Okay, And now you do the same averaging method, and then you arrive not at a total number. See, before we were controlling the total volume of the, of the set, but now we, but we could also do this just for the outside volume, outside of something. And when you do this, then you arrive at such an error bound, and then you can go through this Solovay strategy, and everything works. So I will not tell you more about this, except that it can be used in other problems as well. We've used it in some, and I think there are several more applications. That brings me to the end of my talk. Let me tell you what I told you. I tried to convince you that the liquid drop model despite its simplicity, has a very rich mathematical structure. I showed you that there are many different mathematical questions that remain open that would probably yield to very interesting mathematics. I've shown you that we made some recent progress on some, of, uh, some questions. And I also tried to tell you that some of the progress that we made on the liquid drop pro problem actually allowed us to, to prove a, an old problem in atomic physics using the methods that we developed there and that hopefully can be extended further. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention and as always, stay safe. Thank you.